Uh, my name is Colin Arnott. I'm a junior uh, computer science major, and this semester I did some mentored research with uh, uh, Professor Ma Montek and Leah. Uh, sorry. Um, so the motivation behind this uh, work is current uh, image sensing uh, has fairly low dynamic range compared with what, say, the human eye can do. Uh, most screens are going to output about 8 bits, and the cameras are going to get probably about 12 bits maximum. Um, and they're also go uh, going to be limited to a frame-based capture. So if I'm going to take a picture, it's going to collect uh, information over a set period of time. And then once that period uh, is done, it stops collecting. And so the two images down here on the bottom you see are some of the issues you have with uh, uh, low dynamic range. Uh, on the one hand, you lose a lot of information in the bright areas when you try and get the dark um, uh, parts of the sky in the back of the city there. And then on the um, other end, you lose a lot of the dark information when you just get the bright uh, lights. So we are hoping to, we were uh, looking to increase the dynamic range up to hopefully about 32 bits. Um, couple, coupling that with high definition really builds a powerful image sensor that you can do a lot with. And by leveraging some uh, asynchronous design, uh, we can actually get frameless image capture. So the typical organization for a uh, image sensor is going to have the sensor array uh, shown here in red and some processing logic off down to the bottom. Uh, the sensor array is going to be comprised of rows, uh, sorry, columns that all have uh, individual pixels in it and they're going to have some shared uh, uh, logic that allows them to push the uh, push that down in uh, to the processing logic, and you can see the errors down there at the bottom. Uh, the each pixel is going to have three major components to it: uh, the photoreceptor, an integrator, basically a capacitor, and then some sort of in pixel processing. Uh, the photo detector is basically uh, photosilicon, and it's allowing you to take light in and convert that into electrons. And then that gets pushed off to the integrator. The, that will uh, basically functions like uh, one would a bucket in a rainstorm. Uh, you collect uh, electrons, in this case water droplets, and you can have small buckets and large buckets, and there are trade-offs there. Uh, your smaller buckets are going to give you uh, more <coughs> information in the dark areas, but you'll start to see the washing out from the previous slide that you'd see in the bright areas. Uh, like uh, which is complemented by if you've got a big bucket, you really lose a lot of information in the dark areas. Uh, the in-pixel processing can usually, usually ends up going one of two ways. Either you can uh, convert the analog signal coming out of the uh, integrator, because it's a pretty analog component, uh, into a digital signal and then push it down the pipeline uh, over on the side. Or you can send down all analog signals and frequently you see cheaper cameras and cheaper sensors use the analog approach uh, because there's less uh, circuitry involved in actually, uh, less circuitry in the pixel. And that's adva it's, adv it's advantageous because you can get a larger <coughs> photo detector, but you, you're going to lose a lot of information from uh, noise and other uh, electrical interference like crosstalk. Um, the uh, so the prior art for what we were uh, looking to uh, build off of usually uses an approach where the in-pixel processing is going to output uh, discrete events. And then the discrete events are going to be summed up in the logic that's off down at the bottom of the chip. Um, the accuracy here is going to be limited to the number of events that you can record. And that it gives you a very integer-based uh, way of counting things. And it's easier to implement, but has some flaws that I'll uh, get to later. Um, you also, because this is a framed system, are going to lose any partially filled buckets. So if you've got a really, really dark region, you might only get one photon, or not even a photon, or say part of the bucket is going to get filled. And you won't be able to dump the entire bucket, which won't generate an event. But there is some information there. Um, that you are losing. What's an event? Uh, in this case, events are uh, a one time that the capacitor is going to fill and empty. So every time that empties, uh, it's going to 
uh, push a signal to the Impixel processing unit, and that will uh, generate in in the uh, analog to digital version. Uh, it will send a uh, digital signal down the wire, and that's an event. Um, so the approach that we were looking to take was to combine uh, two uh, two things. One, we want to instead of measuring event, discrete <coughs> events. We were looking to measure the time between events. And that allows us to, instead of have a linear scale, we can use the inverse of the linear scale and get a really nice gradation. Uh, as the asynchronous nature uh, allows us to uh, get away from this na notion of frames. And we can really look at the very dark pixels and very bright pixels differently. Um, as I was indicating, so this is what you would see. Uh, the prior art here is going to have these discrete steps. And they're going to show that either you'll have a value at 1 or at 2. But since we're using time in between, we can get roughly uh, 10 to the 6th uh, increase in terms of um, uh, information that we're transmitting because we can uh, get all of those little steps in between. And uh, time can be measured much more accurately on a sensor than something like discrete events. Um, because for our approach where we're spreading this across you know, plenty of time, we might only get a, uh, an event or two events, those bucket uh, empties, uh, in the time interval. And we know exactly how far apart they are. But if you're only counting events, you only know that there are two of them. And they could have been you know, two right at the beginning and then a bunch, of no a bunch of nothing at the end. So it allows us to more accurately um, get a uh, calculation on that. Um, so as I indicated, there's uh, intent to, we were wanting to use an asynchronous uh, design <coughs> here. And the uh, pipeline is going to look like the diagram over on the side. And it will allow you to insert events as you need to. Um, this helps both in the frameless sense, but also because when you use an asynchronous approach, you only need components talking to one another when there are things happening. And so you're you can get advantages in terms of um, uh, power consumption as well. Uh, the dynamic range of our system is going to be uh, determined based upon the uh, maximum number of events that the brightest and the darkest pixels can generate. And the max, the max events in this case uh, is going to be limited by the amount of events that the network uh, on this pixel uh, sensor can use. And so uh, when you hit saturation with that, you start to lose information. Uh, the minimum events, uh, since we have this frameless approach, can be longer than a normal uh, frame would be. And so I can set a camera in a very dark room and get information coming just a short amount from the very bright pixels and get a much wider amount of uh, time for the darker pixels and still get information in both regions. Uh, one of the tricks that we can do to further increase this is prescaling or decimation. And for this approach, uh, there, there's a suggested frame uh, that we need to give the sensor. And this, based on the suggested frame, we can say, you know, if the events are coming too quickly to the, um, uh, the in-pixel processor here, the comparator, uh, we're able to, say, only emit one event every two or every four. Uh, that way, we can double or if you use a larger scaling factor, we can go even further into how much uh, advantage you get out of that. Um, as I indicated, the frameless capture is really advantageous because you don't need to, you're, you're getting time between events. And so because you're able to spread that out between different events, you can also minimize um, uh, jitter in the uh, photons that are coming in because they're discrete events coming in at what are functionally random intervals. And so if I get, you know, Three events, they might come all very quickly. But if I can get these three events and I know the time between them, it's going to be a much more accurate uh, value for the intensity of the pixel. So the work that I uh, did was um, 
in uh, both the sample scene and the uh, out and the image output here. Uh, the functional simulation was something that was um, uh, mostly uh, uh, Professor Montek's uh, uh, work, and I uh, it's a C++ hardware model. Uh, there are a lot of things that it does well, such as implementing the hardware logic. At the same time, physical phenomena like crosstalk and noise on the on the wires are things that need to be predicted beforehand, and then impl and then added in as constants uh, to the model. So, uh, for this sample scene generation, there were there were some difficulties because there are no cameras currently that can capture this much information in the scene. So you. You end up having to um, uh, generate these scenes uh, from uh, 3D models, and you can't use real-world images. Uh, one of the other issues that we ran into was that the file format for having um, uh, this much information is not something that you see in a standard PNG or a GIF. And so we needed to go to a file format known as OpenEXR. And the images you're seeing in the back here are stock images, sample images from their site. And you can see that there's a varied amount of um, dynamic range that you can get from those. Um, it's uh, an industry format uh, designed by Industrial Light and Magic. Um, and it's supported in uh, rendering tools such as Blender. Uh, the nice thing about Blender was the tool chain uses the full double precision floating points for the entire uh, process of calculation. Uh, so we didn't need to worry about it being truncated internally uh, before it got output into the uh, per, uh, single precision floating points that we wanted as output. Uh, another issue with uh, using sample scenes uh, is that you really need to tailor what you're getting if you are looking at a uh, scene. And so this is the scene that we actually used. And I had to go in here and manipulate the lighting sources such that one of them was very bright uh, because the standard dynamic range is scaled so that it would look good on a PNG. And that has a much tighter dynamic range. Um, as you can see, this is an indoor scene. We tried some outdoor scenes as well. And the issue that we ran into was that the outdoor scenes tended to have a much more compressed dynamic range. And you have a lot more control with the indoor uh, scenes because of lighting. Uh, Blender has a has two main uh, render uh, agents that it uses. There's a cycles render and an internal render. Uh, the cycles render is much more true to uh, real simulation. Uh, the internal render is more of a uh, quick and dirty thing that will output things very quickly. And so uh, the image you see here is a single cycle on the cycles render. And we ran into uh, I ran into some issues with runtime where you, in order to get really good looking images, you need a lot of cycles. And so uh, I'm going to step here through a few of them. And you can see they start getting less uh, pixelated and more. It, it starts to transition into grain here. And you see the cycles down there on the bottom are increasing. Um, <coughs> up until you get here to 100,000. And this, the actual calculations we did were in the million range. Um, and it took quite a while to get these. Uh, the Simulation itself output basically raw um, uh, unencoded floating points. And so I had to uh, both convert initially the OpenEXR format into a format that the simulation could handle, and then back into uh, the OpenEXR format to display later. Um, and one of the very nice things about the displayer that comes uh, with this open uh, format is that it has a nice exposure slider. So you can display all 32 bits of information, even on something like a, a monitor that's only going to output about 8 bits. Uh, the results that we had, uh, there was a, an SNR about 60 dB for the prior art. Um, and then, as I indicated previously, we, tr we tested both de with and without decimation. And that's the scaling factor. And as you can see, the decimation does look, uh, it does give you better output. Um, I'm going to switch over to the actual viewer now, and it's going to be a stitched image. And on the left, you'll see the prior art, and over on the right is the approach that we had. So that's here. And uh, let me start here, the dark region first. 
So the prior art, as you can see, is having a lot of issue with the very, very bright lights because the way that this is displaying exposure, only the brightest lights are being, uh, only the brightest uh, pixels are being shown right now. And so as we continue to step up here, we see that this scene starts to come into view. And if you, uh, if you were to compare this to the other images I was showing you previously, this white region here is the same as the washed out um, uh, building in front of the uh, St. Saint, uh, Louis Arch. And if we keep going, you'll start to see what is referred to as banding here in the corner. And this banding is because of the fact that the prior art uses an integer-based system to keep track of the very, very dark regions. But over on the right, our method does not use this. And thus, you see a clean transition with no banding. And that continues up until uh, the image basically just washes out. All right. Uh, any questions? Questions? So I have a non-technical question. OK. I was surprised by the spelling of color you used. I was color. Uh, you, you, you advisors uh, doing? Uh, no. Uh, it's the you spell check on my machine. English. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? I said you learned proper English? Uh, apparently. <laughs> Um, so it's a signal to noise ratio. Um, it's an indication. So we had a sample image, uh, sort of a source image. And so we could compare directly what the sensors should be outputting as a sort of perfect scene as compared with what actually came out of the simulation. And so the, the, uh, for the signal to noise ratio of that, again. yeah. So on the, the mm -hmm. left picture of the prior yes. art, you said 60 mm -hmm. dB. Yes. On the right hand side, you said 120 yes. dB. Yes. And you're wanting, for, for that, higher values indicate better performance? No, is it oh, just sorry. twice as good? Or what does 120 dB mean versus 60 dB? Um, it, that, that's the distinction between the, uh, what you're seeing, the, it's the amount of loss that you're seeing in terms of the very, very bright pixels and the very dark pixels. 60 dB means about 1 to 1,000. OK. And 120 dB means 1 to a million. So the noise in that picture is 1,000 times less. Um, so from the description in the program, uh, mm -hmm. it mentions that uh, you guys are trying for a higher dynamic range for the sensor, about 20 bits. Um, but you also mentioned that you guys were using 32 bits. Is that just a change that was not incorporated into the description? The, um, Functionally, yes. Uh, the, the output format that we're using is floating points. So the simulation, I believe, is using the 32-bit uh, precision floating points. Um, I should probably um, uh, let uh, 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 Professor. Well, the yeah. file format can handle 32 yes. bits. The actual hardware right yeah. now is about at 20 bits. Yeah. Okay. 